Welcome to Forbes Talks. I'm Brittany Lewis. Joining me now is Chloe Sorvino, a staff writer here at Forbes. Chloe, thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Of course, and you are also the author of Raw Deal, which, when is it coming out? December 6th. Okay, tell us about it. This book was inspired by nine years of reporting at Forbes, talking to billionaires, hearing them talking about how much they're making off the meat industry at the same time as when I was reporting on meat packers being closed in the pandemic and just seeing climate change evolve and really impact our food system. So I really needed to get this message out there and share with the world how hidden corruption and corporate greed has been impacting meat. So the book starts with the pandemic. Why is that such an inflection point in the meat industry? It was a really catalyzing moment for a lot of consumers of meat who had never really thought too much deeper about mm -hmm. where their food and where their meat comes from and all the different ways in which it is made and which can be very harmful for the environment, but also for the workers and the community surrounding production. And so I think when people all of a sudden were seeing you know, meat flying off the shelves, meat, you know, cases being empty, it was shocking. And there could be more to come. And I think there are other crises that we will be continuing to face with climate change. And mm -hmm. so I think both of these factors yeah. were wild for people to really understand. Yeah, it was definitely a really tumultuous time in the country for a multitude of reasons. And you write that in your book, or in your book, you write that um, John Tyson actually took out a New York Times ad where he claimed the quote, food supply chain is breaking. And you report that quote, the ad was published within seven months of the 2020 presidential election. Americans historically haven't kept politicians in office when they're unhappy with me. Why? America's economy has been shaped by the meat industry for generations and as diets have followed along suit with that. And so, you know, John Tyson, when he took out that ad, he was seeing plants shutting down, workers not showing up, workers getting sick, and he wanted to make sure the lights in his plants were staying on so he could continue to make more meat, continue to export it across the world, and also continue to have his workers staying on the line. And so there was a lot of different things to unpack when he placed that ad and started trying to kind of rally support mm -hmm. around keeping meat packers open, it got super, super, super politicized in the sense that, you know, there's been a lot of audits and different, you know, investigations into how this really happened and how there were you know, nearly 300 deaths and nearly 60,000 workers getting sick from this pandemic, from staying in the plants and continuing to work. And so, you know, you have a lot of power, a lot of interest in keeping business going, a lot of people who still need food, of course, across the country, and it was an essential service. But at the same time, then in Tyson Plants, you also have white collar managers placing bets, this horrific betting pool on workers and saying how many of them would die. That eventually led to the firings of seven different plant workers at one plant in Iowa. That's just one example. You know, there mm -hmm. was a concerted effort from meat packers like this CEO of Tyson, but also Smithfield and a lot of other lobbyists for the meat industry to have a say in how the regulations and how the government was interacting with them and how they could keep plants open, how they were interacting with workers. And so we see this all coming to light with this ad and the stress and the tension placed on the food system because of it. Of course, and 2020 wasn't the first time that you saw this sort of intersection of meat and politics in the United States. Can you give us a brief history lesson here of how this has happened kind of throughout American history? Absolutely, I mean, there's countless stories and I mean, the original uh, Packers and Stockyards Act was even you know, put in place because there was so much consolidation in meat and so many which meat prices rising and consumers getting so mad about it. And so there's different points throughout history where meat was boycotted or consumers were demanding lower prices or demanding the meat industry change. And having a kind of stronger say in actually the fluctuations in price and how things were going. But as meat packers took on more control, that all, all got a little got a little different. But in 1947, for example, Democratic Party had a 16-year control of Congress, mm -hmm. and the meat prices got so bad, and people got so upset about them, the boycotts got so vitriolic that 
they lost the House, and it was the first time a Republican had been in essentially since for nearly almost two decades. Wow, and is this problem unique to, or th this relationship between meat and politics, is it unique to the United States, or does this happen all over the world? Meat is such a key source of nutrients and source of food around the world, so it's been a part of policy since, you know, as old as time in some ways. Mm -hmm. But in the U.S., there is a specific culture around us needing meat, us needing more meat, and us demanding it from this industry. And and that has really drove the industry to feed the world and deliver meat around the world. And aside from it being really closely tied to politics, billionaires also have a tight grip on the meat industry. Can you elaborate? There are so many billionaires who have kind of carved out these niches of wealth pockets of wealth in the meat industry. You have John Tyson, who I spoke about. You have the billionaire owner of Smithfield, who's in China. There's a lot of foreign ownership in our meat industry, actually. There are two Brazilian beef billionaires who have driven a lot of consolidation in the, just the past decade alone in the U.S. industry, really have taken over the industry in a lot of ways. That's JBS. Then you also have you know, a lot of uh, sm other players, and you have Ted Turner even with his bison. He controls 50% of the bison market. And so you have different aspects, but what it boils down to is that there is a lot of wealth and power maintained in the hands of a select few, and that's really dictated what gets to consumers from supermarkets to restaurants and fast food everywhere. So if it's just in the hands of a select few, how is this not considered a monopoly? Well, it's had antitrust scrutiny on it for generations, decades. It's really been consolidated like this for mm -hmm. the past five decades. Beef, more than 80% is controlled by the top four players. In pork, more than 70% is controlled. And in chicken, it's 60. So it's it's really, it's, it's huge. And just to kind of put that into context, antitrust you know, experts will say that something's, an industry is super, super consolidated if there's 20 to 25% controlled by one company. So just that's yeah. that's the context. <laughs> that's the bottom line. Okay. Yes. And so you have top four in mm -hmm. each industry controlling huge swaths of these markets and being able to dictate the prices they pay to producers, how these splits work, how the how they get the feed, where they get their genetics from, how these animals are raised, and then you also have them dictating how much they're going to pay for it to get sold to slaughter, and then. Also then implicating how much they're going to eventually sell it to a retailer. So why can't Congress do more to protect consumers from these few big players? There's been several bills out there. There's been lots of calls for reform over decades. You know, I think it's one of the most politicized and highly vitriolic mm -hmm topics across politics and that's because you know there's meat produced in every single state that is representatives in every single state that have constituents calling them saying they need to protect me they need to do more for me you need to get better regulations more subsidies more crop insurance more everything and you've seen over the years how the meat industry has gotten favorable regulations, how regulations have, like for the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act have been eaten away at over time. And that's all been backed by millions and, and lobbying and other kind of advocacy money from billionaires. And you mentioned earlier that there are two brothers from Brazil um, that are lead J or part of JBS, and they're big players in the meat industry, and they got America really entangled in this scandal. Tell us more. The scandal of JBS is nuts, and I think everyone in America who eats meat has probably had a bite of JBS meat at this point in time. Before a decade ago, this Brazilian meat wasn't even in the country, and these Brazilian meat packers didn't even own iconic assets in the US. Mm -hmm. But just in the past decade, they've really commandeered a huge amount of the American meat industry in beef and chicken and in pork. And there's two billionaires behind JBS who charted this crazy US expansion and otherwise international growth. And they did this while at the same time there was this bribery scheme in Brazil that they were 
a part of leading even that entangled three Brazilian presidents, thousand plus politicians. They end up getting one of the biggest fines Brazil ever levied on a corporation, more than $3 billion for corruption. And at the same time, then they use a lot of these ill-gotten gains, these this money, they got all these loans from a state-owned bank and through these back channels that help them get financing to do these U.S. deals. And so they then were doing this bribery behind the scenes, using the ill-gotten money to acquire iconic infrastructure in the U.S. And now here we are a decade later, and everyone's like, oh, shit. So how what can america do to kind of stop this or why are they still allowed to do business here there's been millions of dollars that the u.s government has even given to jbs in 2021 and this year through public school lunch program purchases and other other purchases of that nature and so i think that really speaks to how intertwined this company has ingratiated itself really mm -hmm. into the fabric of American meatpacking. It's gonna be very hard to unwind and untangle what's happened, but there are several regulators and some lawmakers who have been seriously looking at what they can do to limit the types of support that the US government gives to JBS. So aside from JBS, you found in your reporting that foreign billionaires really own an enormous amount of America's beef industry. You said approximately 45% of the pork industry and a third of the country's beef supply. Can you walk us through how this happened? A lot of it was driven from JBS. JBS owns more than 20% of the pork supply, uh, more than 20% of the chicken industry, and is the second largest in all of beef. So. Again, these ill-gotten gains, bribery-related funds have been linked to this consolidation in the U.S. Aside from that, there's Smithfield and the billionaire owner in China who you know, had acquired that huge pork company and then also started acquiring other pork companies in the U.S. And now it's the world's largest pork producer. And so that's just, again, one sector. but. There's a real national security concern with this, and there are a lot of advocates who have questioned what happens in climate crisis when local interests may want meat or protein or whatever it is to stay locally or to feed a crisis or an emergency happening, but then perhaps the other interest, maybe the owner wants it to go back to China to feed whatever crisis is happening there. I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are seeing this tension beginning mm -hmm. to arise and wondering how it can be mitigated because the consequences are very serious. So how have been people mitigating this so far or not at all? There was a bill recently about foreign ownership of farmland mm -hmm. in the Congress and it, it didn't progress unfortunately and right now even that is a huge issue. Why didn't it progress, you know? This politicized issue, people don't want to anger the beef lobby, the meat industry. It is a super powerful region that is Would just, that be like political suicide to do so? It would absolutely be political suicide. So, whew. well, aside from all of that corruption and politicization of the meat industry, you report that the meat industry has unsafe working conditions. So you really detail the experience of this one woman, Carmen Lita, who was working at a meat packing uh, plant. Can you elaborate on her experience? That story really just shook me. Mm -hmm. And I went through hundreds of lawsuits to decide what we want to put in the book at the end of the day. And I just had to leave with Carmen Lita's story because not only is there harassment and a pattern of it escalating and her being ignored and continue to be sidelined in this plant, a, a JBS plant in Utah. Um, but on top of that, you know, she was a member of the a Native American group in Utah and felt such a strong visceral reaction to what she saw in the plant that she also included not just harassment, but religious discrimination in her suit. And, you know, that all kind of culminated in this moment where you know, she had been hurt and injured on the job several times and pushed aside. And then eventually her manager told her that she got her essentially her last potential assignment and this was the only place they wanted to put her. And that ended up being this place that everyone at the plant called the gut bin. 
Can you describe the guppin? Heinous, horrendous, mm -hmm. feces, grease, lots of all these just kind of rogue elements, animal parts. A place no one wants to work. Yes, and Carmelita said she had such a visceral reaction to the atrocities she saw in the gut bin that she had an immediate psychological breakdown because it just completely misaligned with everything she had ever understood about nature and her religion. Is her experience common in these types of work environments? There are countless stories of harassment and discrimination that I've seen via lawsuits just even, you know, let alone mm -hmm. workers coming forward and not doing anything legal and sharing their own personal stories. There unfortunately just is a, a pattern in these plans of violence and, you know, unfortunately often cases that they're being ignored and retaliated against. Yeah, and you detailed cases of both unsafe working conditions, someone had a miscarriage, they were pregnant, someone, I think it was Carmen Lita, hurt her elbow, things like that. Also, sexual harassment was rife in what you were reporting. So is there any progress on either of these fronts being made in these plants? I can't speak to that. I mean, there, there's, there's nothing substantial, nothing meaningful that has put forth that, that, that would protect these workers. There are unions. I think that's one of the strongest ways to protect these workers. And uh, like in Carmelita's case, even her union rep was representing her and fighting for her, which is how she was partially able to get a settlement. But in a lot of cases, these plants are at the mercy of the managers and it's a very case by case situation. So aside from what you just outlined and really harming workers, the current meat industry also isn't great for the environment. Can you elaborate on that? Aside from the emissions, which represent a huge amount and have caused irreversible damage, you know, not, it's not just fossil fuels. The industrial meat production system has contributed irreversible damage to the climate and has been driving global warming. How so? So through the energy used, mm -hmm. the methane produced through parts of production, I can get into some gross stories of how I've been one of the only journalists to see hog manure lagoons and the biogas chambers. And haven't table. people been <laughs> killed in those? Yes. Like that's how, is it because there's such disgusting chemicals in there or like, can you explain? Both. I mean, some of the, sometimes the noxious fumes are so bad that they truly asphyxiate and can't breathe anymore. And there's drowning, people die trying to fall in or trying to rescue other workers. It's, so imagine what's, what that's doing to the environment. Yeah, no, so that's that's just, so taking a step back, I mean, not, it's not, all, my point is that it's not only the emissions. Mm -hmm. it, obviously it's one of the main uses of fossil fuels and one of the main drivers of emissions. But aside from that, meatpacking has been harming waterways specifically. In, in really heinous ways, pollution, groundwater damage, um, soil damage from that. Um, on top of that, there's been a lot of air pollution that has really gone unchecked, just, again, despite things like the Clean Air Act. Um, and then you also have just constant land use issues, you know, as, as meat is increasing, it's taking up a lot of land and then making that land less productive in some ways. And overall though, one of the other biggest drivers, which you didn't talk about, is just what they're actually eating. I mean, these livestock, when they're produced in industrial settings, they eat a lot of corn, they eat a lot of soy, and that corn and soy itself and all those other commodities that are going into the feed have been farmed itself with harmful chemicals and pr creating a system of monoculture where diver biodiversity is being lost and soil health is just com being completely eroded. And so that's one aspect of it. The waste is another aspect of it. All these things roll together and meat has had a huge impact on the climate. So the plant-based industry was really touted as this way to combat these climate challenges. But you write in the book that quote, it's sometimes hard to differentiate between businesses that say they are doing right by the environment and ones that actually are. Can you speak to that? Absolutely, and that goes for meat as well as all the plant-based brands and alternative proteins you're seeing at the grocery stores. They have so much investor money behind these plant-based brands that there's been this frenzy to profit, this frenzy to grow as, quick, as big as possible, but there hasn't been a lot of emphasis on actual sourcing and you know all the different ramifications that has been impacted by the environment. And so you, know, you don't see any 
change whatsoever in terms of what ingredients are being used in these products. It's still the same harmfully farmed commodities and promoting, you know, diversity loss and soil erosion and horrible things that could really create the next dust bowl, you know, as an aside. Um, so, you know, I think the plant-based alternatives have a lot of environmental questions around them. They also have a lot of health questions around them. You know, they're ultra processed foods, with a lot of additives, they're not whole nutrients. And there's a lot of different, you know, supplemental additives being put in there to mm -hmm. add flavor science and different things. And so what do you think that these industries, both meat and plant-based, could do to move towards more ethical practices, both especially in the meat industry when it comes to workplace safety, but for both for environmental safety as well? I mean, there's, there's countless reforms that could be made that would improve so many different aspects of what's been happening here. You know, anything, you know, even on the financial side of things, talk about, you know, reporting that happens for insider trading. Why can't all meat purchases on the open markets be reported and have those prices be, you know, discoverable and even not on the open markets? I think transparency and accountability overall would be super powerful on so many different levels of the problems. But would we ever get to a point that you think that the meat industry would be transparent even a little more? Uh, there's huge transparency issues. I think I would, I, it would be hard to trust. It really would. I think no matter what, though, we will have to have the meat industry work hand in hand with better for you meat producers and other sustainable farmers and everything we need to make this food system stronger and healthier and more sustainable because there's just like not enough time to waste. Climate change is getting worse by the day and they have so many assets, so many people working for them, so much structure in place that it just has to be used. It has to be repurposed towards better systems. And one of my favorite parts of your book, you went to a poultry plant in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is where I was born and raised, to quote, test the theory that local meat in its purest form is better for the climate and ethically superior for both worker conditions and animal welfare. What did you find? You know, I think there's always trade-offs, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And while I think the workers there were doing great, and I myself was feeling a backache from holding chickens and having to carve with one hand and the whole thing, you know, I think there's some real problems with the local food movement. In the past decade, it's been touted, and it really still has never made a significant dent in total volume. And that's been disappointing to see. And so I think we need to support local food systems, regional producers, farms like Carversville that, you know, support 90% of soup kitchens in Philadelphia, but then also have a very small on-farm stand that, like, sells the rest. You know, I think there's just there's just not enough uh, there's just not enough scale in those systems, and so it's hard to put you know the weight of optimism behind mm -hmm. something that truly can't scale and is only you know doing what it's doing because some rich people decided they wanted to do it and get their tax breaks that way. So would it be feasible for plants to be modeled like this or no, unless there's a bunch of rich people that want to get their tax breaks that way? That's the thing. I think, yeah. you know, it's a great model to replicate. It's not going to be a model to scale. There's some amazing things that they're doing. And anyone who wants to get their own tax break can absolutely start their own farm. And I would hope they do it that way instead of what Bill Gates is doing, who became the largest farmland owner in the country. And he just pretty much rents it out to very large corporate farmers that aren't doing anything, you know, good sustainably um, and, and things like that. And so, you know, I think there's an opportunity. It provides a path forward, but I struggle with solutions that are still at the end of the day up to, you know, a rich person's charity. Yeah, and you've been covering um, food and agriculture for years at Forbes. So this book is really a culmination of years of investigative research. And I'm just wondering, what surprised you the most in all of your research? What surprised me most in all my research was that, you know, I've been one of the few journalists who's had access to actually be in these slaughterhouses. Mm -hmm. I worked this slaughter also in 2020 on a very small scale farm, so I've seen the breath of it yeah and it really hit home for me when I was doing the antibiotics resistance chapter actually because I learned through reporting that that 
there's such a grave risk long term for workers that I truly don't think workers really understand if they are taking a meatpacking job or even if they're working a summer um, over one summer over college or something at, at their mm -hmm. local meat packer because there are super bugs that could cause the next pandemic and there's also super bugs that can invade our own bodies and mm -hmm. they can exist in our guts and what I really didn't realize was that that super bug it may never ignite in your body it also may ignite far later so it could get ignited by some piece of inflammation or maybe you get pneumonia or you get you know another disease and you're in the hospital and all of a sudden that pneumonia could flip on a dime mm -hmm. because that superbug came in and there's nothing no antibiotics that can cure that disease and I think just knowing that I could have a superbug in me right now anyone who's worked in these plants could Shocking. Terrifying. Terrifying. And I think that harkens back to, you know, the uh, workplace safety conversation we had earlier because these people are exposed to so much, yet you wrote they can't even afford the chicken that they're packing. Like, they can't even afford to bring that home, and yet they're exposed to these crazy health risks. It's one of the most gross hidden costs of our meat system today, truly. Uh, like, the ramifications that these workers face and may not even realize they face. So what do you think's next for the meat industry? <sighs> Big change. I want to see a lot more grazing, a lot less chemical laden animal feed. I want to see actual projects that aren't just test piloting and, you know, taking a tiny percentage of land or, you know, market that they control and actually putting some weight behind this because we mm -hmm. just don't have enough time. We need to do this now. The next 10 years is so crucial to create lasting change. There's already been irreversible damage done, but the next 10 years we'll be able to make sure that's not even worse. Yeah, and Chloe, you've covered this for almost 10 years. You visited the kill floor of a slaughterhouse in Omaha, and aside from many other visits to all other places, including this um, slaughterhouse in Pennsylvania, but has this changed the way you consume meat? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I was nicknamed Mickey D's on my field hockey club team <laughs> growing up. You know, I was constantly eating McNuggets in between yeah. tournament games. So, you know, I've really taken a step back over the past several years since that slaughterhouse visit and even a little bit further than that. But I've decided that for me, I know that I want to make sure how I'm sourcing is just as important as what I'm putting into my body. And I think a lot of folks think about local and supporting grass-fed or pasture-raised producers or antibiotic-free producers and all that's all well and good. It just as much is important to think about the financial systems you're supporting and the businesses you're supporting because real change will only happen if people are getting the most for their dollars. And I mean that by that, you know, if producers are being empowered to make the change themselves. Chloe, I read the book, I loved the book, I texted my family, and as soon as I was finished and I said, listen, I need to change the way I'm consuming meat. So where can people find the book and when? It makes me so happy to hear. Uh, December 6th, anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, audio books, Kindle, you name it, bookshop, local, independence, please. So excited to get it out there. Great, Chloe Servino, thank you so much.